So the influences of a lifetime, wow, you become a different person over time and there's so many things that affect you, you know, and many times there are things that you don't even realize are going on. Um, but in the end, they sort of become the raw materials of your creativity. So they're important, you know. So I was born in uh, Providence, Rhode Island. It was mostly working class people, fairly blue collar. And this meant that I met like lots of different kinds of kids from lots of different um, sort of families. And, you know, and I got beaten up well into middle school. It taught me a uh, certain humility about life that I think was good for me. Uh, my mom and dad were certainly big influences. My, my dad was an insurance guy and he had a wonderful sense of humor and uh, has a big intelligence that has affected me my whole life. My mother went to art school. She taught me to draw. She taught me how to print things. She took me to museums. I'm sure some of that rubbed off a little bit. I'm a public school kid and actually I'm kind of proud of that. I remember a couple of moments in grade school that I think were particularly affecting for me. One was we had to make a costume. For some reason, and this dates me a little bit, I chose to be a um, cigarette machine. I sort of had cigarette packs like all over this cardboard box. And there were like buttons that you could, you know, put money in and so on. And, and I won the contest. Doing little performance things like that were good for you. I was obsessed with baseball. It's slow and perfect and contemplative, and I'm sure that that's affected me over the years. I went to high school in East Greenwich, Rhode Island. I was a bad basketball player and a good football player. I was in a band called The Runaways. We actually did a really bad job of like dyeing our hair with uh, hydrogen peroxide of some kind, just burned our hair basically. And we went to school that way and people like thought we were crazy. And I suddenly realized that being a little bit different, not too different, was, was a good thing, you know? I had friends that like to go out at night and perform vandalism, small acts of vandalism, like breaking pumpkins and waxing windows and stuff. And we actually one night tied Mr. Mistretta's bumper to a downspout on his garage. When he drove away the next day, it pulled the downspout off of the garage and then went clanking down the street. But I think we were so excited by it and we looked forward to the effect of it. I think you should have that feeling in advertising. You should look forward to having your thing run and like mess people up, you know? And there should be a little bit of that vandalism in everything that you do. Somehow I got into Harvard after all that. Uh, that was sort of a mediocre English student. I did one day go to Widener Library and start looking at design magazines. And I noticed these advertising things that were being done mostly at an agency in New York called Doyle Dane Birnbach by people like Phyllis Robinson, who was the most terrific writer of the time, and um, Helmut Krohn. I looked at their stuff, like the Volkswagen, you know, Think Small campaign, and I went, wow, this is, this is the way that people think when you talk to yourself inside your head. You know, it wasn't dishonest. It wasn't selling you anything. It was real. And I thought maybe it's an interesting business to be in. I didn't really think I'd ever go into it. I also tried out for the Harvard Lampoon, which at the time, Henry Beard and Doug Kenny had just left the Lampoon to start the National Lampoon, which I think had a lot of effect on all of our senses of humor in the end. And the people that were with me on the Lampoon like Sandy Frazier and Jim Downey, who went on to be the head writer at Saturday Night Live, took that sense of humor that was sort of invented at the Harvard Lampoon and took it forward to the National Lampoon and then to Saturday Night Live in many ways. And that certainly affected me in the kind of sense of humor that I had. Fat, drunk, and stupid is no way to go through life, sir. After school, I started working at the Peabody Times, small um, suburban newspaper. I had to write a lot of stuff and I had to write it fast. I had to like file three stories a day. I'd write them in the middle of a room of people with clacking typewriters everywhere and talking and somebody would be doing a movie review here and somebody would be talking about the date sex that they had last night and you still had to like write about the thing that you were writing on and you had to get it out. I think that's actually been very valuable to me over time. I can write on deadline and, and you know a lot of times my my best ideas come to me really quickly. And if they don't come quickly, sometimes they don't come at all. Around that time, I started drawing for the Peabody Times. Um, they were also noticed by another newspaper, the Boston Herald American, and I started drawing for them and particularly for their Sunday magazine. I didn't really think there'd be any future in drawing much. Um, I was really thinking of myself as a 
as a journalist, you know, I, the new journalism was, was all the rage. Woodward and Bernstein had just made Nixon retire. I loved that kind of writing. I loved Tom Wolfe and Norman Mailer and Truman Capote, Hunter S. Thompson. They all made journalism personal, you know, they didn't worry about the truth or something. They were doing something that was their point of view, what they saw, what they felt. So I began to follow Hunter Thompson in Rolling Stone and the guy that always illustrated him was Ralph Steadman, this British guy, just a crazy illustrator. And, and I started to go, I love this kind of illustration. I wonder if I could do this as well as the writing thing. So I started thinking about that and I started studying Ronald Searle at The New Yorker. And a really big thing that affected me at the time was a thing that they, they called the op-ed page, which was opposite the editorial page. And there were drawings on that page that I thought were just amazing. Um, people like uh, Seymour Quast and, and Milton Glaser, Brad Holland that drew on those pages. And, and I started to emulate like what they did. I loved their illustration and I started trying to emulate it and I got some jobs. I started drawing for Harvard Magazine, which is a, a magazine basically for Harvard graduates, but you know, Harvard graduates are a pretty good audience to draw for, very in influential. And there was a guy there, editor named Kit Reed, who would call me up and um, he had a great sort of Long Island accent that sounded like he had a pencil in his mouth all the time and it would be like, Jeffrey, we have a, an article here about bone cancer and uh, it's not illustratable, I don't think. Do you think you could draw something for it? And, and I'd try to draw something for bone cancer. And, uh, and he liked what I did. He started to let me draw covers. So that actually gave me a lot of show pieces for my stuff. And, and I began to draw for Time Magazine. I drew things for Mother Jones. You know, and these didn't pay a lot of money. They were a few hundred dollars a piece. But I was doing that and, and, and I loved doing it. And around that time, um, my, my wife, who grew up in California, thought that she would really like to live in California again. So we picked everything up and we moved to the only place in California that I think I could stand living, I told her, was San Francisco. It was a crazy time to be there. The leftovers of the Haight-Ashbury time, the Jim Jones thing in South America, the, the assassination of the mayor, all of that happened within just a year or two when we arrived in San Francisco. So when I couldn't get a newspaper job, I tried. So I started thinking maybe I could work at an advertising agency. So I, I went around to all the agencies at the time. You know, there were lots of, lots of agencies from New York that had offices in San Francisco. And so uh, finally I met up with a guy named Charles Martell at, at McCann Erickson. And he said, you're not gonna get a job unless you write some advertising. So I went home. And I wrote a lot of advertising because I took it around and I got a job almost immediately at J. Walter Thompson with a guy named Stu Hyatt. And Hyatt was a guy who had worked at Doyle Dean Birnbach and done a lot of the famous ad, ads that I was seeing at Widener Library in, at Harvard. The place didn't have like great work coming out of it, but they had great people there and there was a great um, culture that made you like advertising and like the intelligence of the people around you, which was really important to me at the time. And I got to do a lot of really interesting work there. He trusted me to do that. And that was incredibly influential for me. I was allowed to make mistakes. I also remember him saying to me, I, he let me do a new business pitch. And I remember talking to this group of, you know, like big business guys at Chevron or something. And Stu said to me, you're doing things that you don't even know you're doing. And I said, wow, that's cool. He said, yeah, that's good. It's a good thing. I began to write on the um, Chevron account there and I did some, uh, some animation that involved uh, these dinosaurs that were in the gas tank of cars because gasoline comes from dinosaurs. <laughs> and a guy named Hal Reine saw that, that advertising on TV. Now Reine was probably the biggest influence on my advertising life and he was the best advertising person in the country at the time with a company of only 26 people. So that was amazing. And people pretty much acknowledged that coast to coast. So we got there at a time when we could still have direct contact with Hal. His standards were just so high. Every single thing had to be perfect. The casting had to be perfect. The, the timing, there was not a place where you made mistakes. I remember being in his office one day when he got a call from one of his friends who was a big director, Dick Snyder, and I could tell that Snyder had said to him, uh, what's going on? And Hal said, I uh, was oh, just trying to make some of the best fucking advertising in the world. 
And he looked right into my eyes as he said that, and I realized that he was telling me to do that. And it was there that, you know, I met Rich and started working with him, which, um, which of course changed a lot of things. There were things that started a little bit earlier, even they, the, the music, especially punk music, the Ramones and the Sex Pistols really affected me because I liked the spontaneity of it, the, uh, the freedom of it. In terms of filmmaking, I really loved the, the French New Wave films like, you know, Godard and, and, and Truffaut, but even more, I think the sort of classic American things like Hitchcock and, and John Huston. And I think that that actually affected our work in many ways. I think it's really important to do things that are not advertising, to be good at this stuff. You have to be a bad musician. Don't touch your life. You don't know where it's been. Which I am, I'm a bad musician. I can play some stuff on the piano and the guitar and violin and so on. I can draw and I can paint, I, you know, but the things that I paint are like portraits of my family. I've painted some animals for my grandson. I've taken a house that we have, vacation house, and, and put like big words on it just for fun. There was no reason, but I think that kind of spirit kind of, you know, affects the way that you work in advertising. You know, I have uh, season tickets to the Warriors and the San Francisco Opera. Those are helpful things. Those influences are important to keep going in your life. I have a little tequila company. It makes me think about something other than what my job is. Finally, you know, there's, there's the having a family. You know, my wife, Jan, and my kids, um, Nina, Grace, and Nat. You know, they're an amazing influence for me and a, a sort of a grounding and, and a sense of humor and, you know, and a sense of not being too important. It's all like a big gumbo of your life, basically. You know, you gotta have a sense of humor, you know. You gotta be groucho. You gotta be a sponge. You gotta take everything in. And then you gotta be, you gotta have the perseverance of a tank, man. You gotta hang in there, you gotta go back and do it again. And when it doesn't work, you gotta learn from it. That's what I look at, you know, along with the so many people in my life, you get like a great freedom um, to use all of those elements. And one of the great things for me has been meeting Rich. He's a person that's visual first, words second. And I'm kind of words first, visual second. He blurts stuff out that, you know, you've just never heard before. I've likened him to uh, night vision goggles for me because he sees things that I don't see. Uh, it's a wonderful kind of influence in life. And that's kind of, it's, it's one of the most important things that can happen. Um, I, I drew a picture of him actually while we were, while we were talking here. I think that this is uh, a nice ending to this thing. <laughs>